Motorsport has provided some incredible beauty over the years. Some machinery that is really artwork rather than industrial design. There are even cars that have been displayed in art galleries. But sometimes it all goes a bit wrong. And either through weird regulations, aerodynamic quirks or just plain balmy designers, the opposite has happened. That's when motorsport produces cars you wish you'd never seen. Here is a selection of some of the very worst offenders. And if you do like this video, please do give it a like and subscribe for more from Goodwood Road and Racing. F1 began a bold new era in 2014. It had new hybrid engines. The cars were transitioning away from high noses that had just got higher and higher with every passing season. It was to be the beginning of something special. But, as with so many things in motorsport, things began very, very badly. Never mind the fact that the first V6 hybrids made birdsong seem loud. It was the fact that, suddenly, pretty much every car seemed to have a sex toy attached to the nose. Simply, this was because new rules mandated the nose must be low, but only set a small minimum width that must reach down to the new level. Loophole hungry engineers, not wanting to lose the better airflow that high noses had brought, mostly chose to keep the nose high and extend a thin section down toward the nose to fulfill the needs of the regulations. They all looked awful. By far the most heinous crime towards aesthetic taste, though, was the Caterham CT05. In 2014, Caterham was on the verge of going out of business, and you could tell there was no real money in the design department at the first race. The original CT05 looked hideous and basic. The team tried to hide the CT05's long proboscis by painting it black, but there was simply no avoiding it. Later in the year, a new version of the nose, which looked more like some other team's interpretations, was introduced, looking marginally better but the original CT-05 was a crime against humanity. Daytona prototypes, at least the ones from the first and second generations, were hideous. All of them. In fact, it's almost harsh to pick one out as the worst offender. The first generation cars looked stubby and bulbous, so they changed the design, and the second generation just made the whole situation worse. The main issue was the big, high cockpits that made the cars look fat. Most of the cars did at least try to create some kind of smooth outline, even though they knew there was basically no hope. Dallara, however, just decided to go all in. The DP01 added to all the usual problems with Daytona prototypes by adding a gaping nose to the front. Or, or is it a mouth? Whatever, it's hideous. Depending which team or engine it was running with, their headlight shape either made the DP01 look so angry it had screwed its entire face up, or so surprised it was pulling some kind of weird duck face. Unfortunately for Dallara, there are not enough Instagram filters to make the DP01 look good. And it wasn't even successful either, having been consistently trounced by the only slightly less ugly Riley. Oh, Panos, what have you done? The Esperante GTR was awesome. The LMP1 Roadster was incredible. The LM07 was weird, but cool. Even the Esperante GTLM looks okay. The 2011 Abruzzi, though, well, it's just awful. This was Dr. Don Panos' big return to racing with his Panos outfit, based in the US state of Georgia, just around the corner from Road Atlanta. Let's look at the good points first, though. It was powered by a 600 horsepower, 800 newton meter, 6.2 liter supercharged V8, an LS3 to be precise. It was a manual, and it had a Panos badge. That's it. Everything else is awful. I mean, just look at it. The Abruzzi looks, quite frankly, like the Batmobile had a hideous accident. Even if we ignore the strange double decker nose arrangement somehow, the rest of the car. It's just a big mess. The back is too fat. The wheels are way too small, and in racing form, the rear haunches just look 
odd. But at least it was successful. No, wait, it wasn't. The Abruzzi raced once in the 2011 Sebring 12 Hours, completing a magnificent 19 laps before disappearing. And with it went Panos's road car division. Thankfully, this was not the final car produced during Don's lifetime. The much less ugly Avezzano came along in 2017, because leaving the Abruzzi as his legacy would have been a travesty. Be very clear here, if you Google Ensign N179, an image search will feed you a lot of pictures of a not particularly bad looking car. Do not be fooled. Focus your eyes on the one with the cheese grater on the front. And if you think that's an odd description for a racing car, well, just look at it. It's hard to work out what happened when they designed the N179. Our best guess is that the whole process went fine, until they took the wraps off the car and someone said to designer Dave Baldwin, Oi, Dave, where's the radiator then? At which point they realised they'd forgotten to include it. With little time to get the car ready for the new season, it missed the first two rounds, they just stuck it on the front and hoped that would work. Or at least that's how I imagine it probably went. It's probably got more to do with cooling and other boring things. At the end of the day, the initial N179 is hideous, and we should all pity Derek Daly and Patrick Guyard for having to be seen in it. Thankfully, like many on this list, an updated car came along later, with radiators where you would expect them to be. But the initial N179 should never be forgotten, or forgiven. Controversy. I can feel your angry comments right now, and hear others just playing closing the tab and not returning. But those of you still here, hear me out. When you stick a very specific livery on the Porsche 91720, in fact, the only one it ever raced in, it is awesome. But if you look at the car objectively and remove that livery, it's just a bit ugly. This one is more in the list due to the difference between its reputation and its actual looks than because it's completely gopping. But I'm afraid the pink pig is objectively ugly. So ugly that, allegedly, its martini sponsors refuse to stick their branding on it, hence the unusual one-off outfit. Whether that story is true or not, we can't confirm. But the fact that it exists is a measure of just how unfortunate the 91720 actually looks. Born as a halfway house between the mighty 917K and the elegant, long-tailed 917LH, the Pink Pig just does not live up to either of its forebears. And, like many on this list, it wasn't a success. Taking to Le Mans with a face only a mother could love, it qualified 7th, crashed out, and never raced again. It now lives in the Porsche Museum and is a cult icon, but that doesn't mean it escapes our keen eye for the ugly. Why was Formula One so darn ugly between 2009 and 2016? It was meant to be the new, prettier era, ending the period of time when the cars were festooned with thousands of aerodynamic flicks and twists. The new cars were to be sleek, and they would also be able to follow each other better thanks to the new wings. But no, not at all. The 2009 cars were not pretty. They had high, thin rear wings and massive wide front wings, which looked completely out of proportion to each other. Some cars looked okay, like the championship winning Braun BGP001 or the Williams FW31, but some, well, some were just ugly. And the worst defender of all, the Renault R29, was not only ugly, it was quite simply both fat and slow. Renault had been on the way up in the second half of 2008, winning races in the hands of Fernando Alonso. But even one of the greatest racing drivers of all time could not pull the R29 above fifth during the first 13 rounds of the 2009 season. The R29 was wide at the back and uh, wide at the front, 
with a nose cone that looked like it was hewn from a block of stone rather than moulded from carbon fibre. And if you take a closer look, you'll see it was actually even bigger than you first thought. Renault painted the underside of the nose black to hide just how huge it was. And, speaking of paint, this whole sandwich of awfulness was topped off with the pickle of an atrocious livery, which looked like the inside of a Cadbury cream egg had been poured all over it. Disgusting. I feel quite harsh adding the Delta Wing here, as so many things about the design are awesome. It was originally a candidate to be the new generation of IndyCar. Then, when IndyCar followed the entire rest of the single make world by adopting a Delara chassis, it was transformed into a sports car, with the drive of the aforementioned Don Panos and a bit of help from Nissan. It raced at Le Mans. It looked awesome. It raced in the ALMS. It looked just as awesome. They stuck a roof on it to comply with new regulations. It looked awful. Suddenly, this lightweight, funky sports car was stuck with one of the problems that cursed the Delara DP01 and others. A silly, high, domed cockpit. And it was then swathed in a chrome livery, which hid precisely nothing. The Delta Wing Coupe looked awful, and it made us feel sad. A splitter was added to the front eventually, but that just gave it a double chin. Every revision just made it worse. Thankfully, it retired in 2017 after IMSA introduced DPI regulations, and they weren't able to fiddle with it anymore. We can only hope that someone, somewhere, has returned it to its original form, so we might one day see it as we wish to remember it. Those, then, are the cars that we think are the ugliest racing cars of all time. But what have we got wrong? Let us know in the comments below.